pray. Oh Lord our God, help us always to be cognizant of the height and the depth and the breadth of your great, eternal, and never-ending love for us. And may that love inspire, shape, and guide us. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart and, more importantly, the response of our hands and our feet to the hearing of your word, may these things be acceptable, for you are our life, our hope, our strength, and our Redeemer. In Christ's name, amen. I want to talk about food, a memorable meal. We're, we're starting a series of sermons today uh, based on the 24 hours that changed the world. In fact, in all of human history, it may be the most significant 24-hour time block that ever was. Actually, if we do the counting, it's probably a little more than 24 hours, but it's the portion at the end of Jesus' life just prior to including and following his crucifixion on the cross that Ad Adam Hamilton has written a good book about that is uh, forming a part of a Lenten study group that is reading along that book and each week we're going to focus on a different chapter of that book. If you don't have a copy of the book, would like to get one, I'm sure the good folks at the, the Bookman could help you get it or you can order it online. I'm, I'm not sure, Chris, are, do we have any extras here? We have one, one extra here. Um, but they're, uh, it's worth reading. There's, uh, Wednesday nights, there's a wonderful uh, video series that goes along with this, this study. Um, at, at the outset, we're going to talk about a memorable meal. Have you had memorable meals? Uh, most of us uh, will have three meals a day, 1,095 meals in the course of a year, if you don't count snacks and Holy Communion on Sundays at church. Uh, in my lifetime, I, I did some rough calculations. Uh, I've probably had close to 70,000 meals, and uh, sometimes I can tell. <laughs> the, the, the meals are... Um, uh, some of them are less uh, memorable than others. I, I don't know how many times I've just gone through a fast food restaurant and gotten something or grabbed something on the way out the door. Uh, other, other meals are a bit more memorable. Uh, one that I will never, ever forget uh, occurred on the 12th of April in the year 2006. It was a Wednesday it was the 14th day of Nisan in the Jewish calendar. And Nisan, for Jews, is their first month of the year. The word Nisan means uh, miracles, and uh, it's a, a month that Jews remember every year the most significant event in their history. On that particular day, Nancy and I had already learned that we were being moved from being pastor in North Muskegon to going to Holt after 14 years in the greater Muskegon area. And we had a friend, uh, Alan Alpert, who is the Jewish rabbi in Muskegon, has been for 38 years. Uh, he and his wife, uh, um, Anna, called us up and invited us to come to the uh, celebration of the Seder. That's the Jewish Passover meal. I, I never even knew about a Jewish... I, I did. I mean, you can read about it in the Bible, but I never really considered what, what a deal that might be. And uh, so we were honored to go. We went to Temple B'nai Israel in uh, downtown Muskegon and walked into their social hall. And what a big deal. It looked like every Jewish person in the county was there and they had the room set up, and it was decorated, and tablecloths, and candles, and it, it was apparent that people had done uh, lots of preparation, and 
we, we sat down to eat and it, it was like no meal I'd ever had. It starts out with a script and Alan told me that this script that they follow, the, the, the liturgy is fairly standard and is used around the world and that they've been doing this since about uh, 1400 years before before Jesus, every year the uh, Jews gather. It's, it's one of the holiest experiences that they have. And it was like a big family reunion. You know, people greeting one another. And the, the table had interesting things on it. It had bitter herbs to, to remind um, them of their time in slavery for 400 years in Egypt. Do you remember that story? If you, if you don't, you can read all about it in the second book in the Bible, the book of Exodus, which describes those 400 years of slavery and the raising up of Moses, who was born a Jew, and then his parents um, had to, uh, because of, it was a crime to have Jewish boy babies, they, they took their baby and they hid him in a basket down by the Nile where he was discovered by a princess of Egypt and taken into the Pharaoh's household and raised as, a, as an adopted prince. And, and then the story uh, fast forwards a, a number of years and uh, Moses gets a, a calling from God to go to Egypt and to have his people freed from their bondage. And so he shows up and uh, if you uh, remember that movie by Cecil B. DeMille, starring Charlton Heston, The Ten Commandments. Some of you old enough to remember that movie. Um, uh, Moses comes in and uh, confronts the Pharaoh, probably his half-brother, and uh, says, let my people go. And the Pharaoh, being a shrewd businessman and realizing that his power is dependent upon the exploitation of the slaves, says the equivalent of no way, Jose. <laughs> and uh, the... the, the uh, the slaves uh, continue in their slavery and God keeps adding plagues to the Egyptians for the refusal of the Pharaoh to listen to Moses. And eventually they, they get to the worst and the greatest plague of all, which is the visitation of the angel of death upon the homes of all of the Egyptians. It's a horrible, horrible thing. Uh, but the angel of death comes and the, the, the Jewish people are told at the time to um, have a meal. And as part of this meal, they are to sacrifice a lamb. They're to take the blood of the lamb and paint the doorpost of their homes on that fateful night. And it was the, the blood of the lamb on the outside of the homes that allowed the angel of death, when it visited Egypt, to know, okay, this is one of the, the, the homes of God's people, and I'm going to pass over that home. In the morning, when the rest of Egypt was experiencing profound grief, the people of Israel, who have been slaves for over 400 years, were finally free. And they remember that event every year with this sacred meal. The other thing that happens in the meal, it was, it was spectacular. There's a sense of family as they, they played games with the children. They, they sang songs. There was a, a sense of anticipation and celebration. And, and the meal is done not just to remember the past, but as a, a living reminder of who we are as people, that God has loved us and redeemed us and we're free. Um, I, I left that meal just thinking, wow, part of me wants to be Jewish too, to be able to uh, connect with this annual celebration. It was a great thing, which, which brings me to this memorable meal in the Scripture. It's the same meal, the, the same liturgy where the, the different parts of the um, deliverance are remembered. I, I mentioned the bitter herbs. There was also salt water in that meal to remember the, the, the tears. There was a kind of a mixture called horseth that had uh, it was a paste made of nuts and fruits and to remind them of the, the mortar 
that was used and the, the buildings and making of the bricks that were part of their slavery. There was the, the lamb bone to remind them of the, the lamb that had been sacrificed. Um, and, and I read this text in here and the, the story of this Passover meal celebrated by Jesus and his disciples didn't include in the memory any of that stuff that I remember. Um, it, it, the Passover meal described in the Gospels is mentioned in four different places. It, it, at least um, it's mentioned in the four Gospels, which means it really is important. There's a lot of things in the Bible that are only mentioned in one Gospel and some in two or three. But if they're mentioned in all four of the Gospels, biblical scholars think, boy, this, this really must have happened. And uh, in Mark's Gospel, this story begins even before the verse that Greg read for us. Um, the, the verses right before that describe Judas Iscariot um, conspiring with the high priest to have Jesus betrayed. And then immediately after that little vignette of Judas conspiring to turn Jesus over, Jesus gives the instruction to the disciples about where to have the dinner. Did you, did you notice that Jesus didn't say, go to 333 Via Dolorosa Way to Mrs. Smith's house and you'll go in there and she'll show you where the upper room is. He says to two of the disciples who are unnamed in Mark but in Luke's gospel they are named as Peter and John. He, he says uh, to them, go into the city and you'll meet a guy carrying some water and follow him and when he enters a house, go in and ask about the room. It sounds like something out of a clandestine spy novel. Um, and, and I think it's because, some biblical scholars speculate, it's, it's because Jesus did not want to tip his hand about where the dinner was going to be held because he knew Judas was going to betray him and he didn't want the betrayal to take place in the middle of a dinner that was really important. He wanted to spend time with the people he loved uninterrupted. And so all the others were kind of in the dark about where the meal was going to be held until they actually showed up. And, and then, in, did, did you notice in the text that... Um, in a meal where I was remembering when we had it with the rabbi, the, the, the great joy and the tradition and the family connection, and uh, the first thing that comes up at the meal is, one of you is going to betray me. <sighs> Have you ever been at dinner parties like that? Where you, where, you, where you come and you're expecting it's going to be one big happy family gathering and then somebody just drops a bomb in the middle of the table and spoils the whole thing? Oh, how do you get past that? You just... And in the other Gospels, there are other parts to the conversation that goes on in addition to you're going to betray me uh, in one of the Gospels, it's remembered that Jesus says to Peter, you're going to deny me. And in another of the Gospels, there, the couple of the disciples are arguing about who's the greatest. And I'm thinking, what does any of this have to do <laughs> with, with what's at hand here? It's just... Um, and, and then in John's Gospel, um, it doesn't remember the meal at all, but it does remember Jesus taking a towel and girding himself like a servant and washing his disciples' feet and then saying, as I've done this for you, so also ought you to do it for one another. And then, in the middle of the, the script that's supposed to remember how God has delivered people centuries before from their bondage and slavery, Jesus changes the script and he takes bread. And it's not bread like this. I mean, I'm a big fan of bread like this. I, I love bread like this. Um, this is wax, but, uh, you know. 
but, but, but I, 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 I love bread that has body and it. it's delicious. Uh, the, the bread that Jesus likely had was matzo. Have you ever had matzo? It's like stale crackers without the salt. It's, it's a bread that when you break it, it snaps. Um, and, and Jesus took that bread and broke it. This is me, he said. Broken for you. And, and then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you. I, I never caught the connection before. The, the blood in the meal of the Passover meal was to remind us all of the blood of the Passover lamb that had been sacrificed, whose blood on the doorpost was the, the difference between life and death for the Hebrews as the, the angel of death saw the blood and would pass over. Christ is our new Passover lamb, and it is his blood that saves us. In 1847, there was a young boy named Homan Walsh, a Canadian, who got up early one morning and decided to enter a kite flying contest. And so he got out his kite and he got out an extra long string and he took it out to the place where the contest was being held and he launched his kite in the air and sometime later, his kite was the first one that came down, and it came down on the American side of the Niagara River at the Niagara River Gorge, and a great cheer went up as uh, he was awarded $5 for being the first person in the history of the world to physically span that river with his kite string which was then taken and tied around a tree. And uh, his end of the kite on the Canadian side of the river gorge was attached to a, a larger cord, and that cord was then pulled across the river, and then the cord was attached to a cable, and the cable was pulled across, and towers were erected on both sides of that river, and that cable then became a bridge, and today there are multiple bridges across that span, and millions of people have been able to cross that river around the falls and enjoy the spectacular thing that God is doing there on a regular basis. And in a very real way, Homan Walsh's kite string reminds us of the much greater chasm that Jesus has crossed and made possible for you and me, starting with this meal that reminds us of God's love that has come to us that we might have life. Amen.